In 1905, Albert Einstein published one of his most famous papers to this day, about the electrodynamics of moving bodies. This paper solved a critical problem of its time, the clash between Newton's laws of motion and Maxwell's electromagnetism. However, to achieve this success, Einstein had to sacrifice a lot since some quantities that were thought to be absolute for decades become relative and were replaced by different quantities that are much more abstract and harder to imagine. And because of this rearrangement of the relative and absolute quantities, we call it a special theory of relativity instead of just relativity. So if somebody tells you that Einstein teaches us that everything is relative, he is lying to you. It is just the relative and absolute quantities are different than we originally thought. One very important quantity that had to be sacrificed is time. And whenever a new person learns about special relativity, this is probably the first thing they learn. Time is relative. This means that whenever you see clock moving, it will always tick slower than yours. And from this you get all the fun stuff, like twin paradox and so on. But whenever you attend a special relativity course, you will always learn about the time dilation the same way. And it is by using light clock that bounces a photon off of a mirror and every time this photon makes a round trip, we detect it on the detector. And by this way, we define a unit of time. Special relativity is based on a postulate that says that the speed of light is independent of the motion of the source. And therefore, it is always one number, whether this clock is moving or not. And because of this, in the moving clock case, the light has to travel a longer distance than in a stationary case. And therefore, the number of time units passed on each clock will be different. If you did the math, you would end up with the famous time dilation equation, which tells you how longer the period on the moving clock is compared to a stationary one. And from this, we say that time runs slower for a moving observer. But natural question is, what happens if we change the clock and make two mechanical clocks move relative to each other. Will the moving clock tick slower than stationary one? How can we know that time dilation is not just a clock issue? Because if it applied only to a specific clock, then our biological age would not change in the twin paradox scenario. So all the fun stuff would become boring. You might say that time dilation was experimentally proven by a number of experiments. And we didn't use this light clock, but atomic clock. And also GPS satellites need to use this time dilation to keep their atomic clock synchronized with the ones on Earth making them accurate. But what are these atomic clocks anyway? Isn't it just a hidden light clock? Since it counts the number of oscillations of an electromagnetic radiation, that is produced by some standardized atomic transition. To answer this question, I want to briefly mention a video from the channel Dialect, as they were able to reconstruct the time dilation using sound wave in a medium instead of light waves. Now, when the clocks are reunited, you find that less time has elapsed on the traveling clock than on the stationary one. And not only that, they even reconstructed the whole twin paradoxical scenario using such a clock. Now, we can repeat this experiment assuming any arbitrary initial velocities of our sound clocks with respect to the air. And the end result will always be the same. Whichever clock turns around to rejoin its companion will always end up showing less elapsed time. This is in consequence of it achieving a greater total average velocity with respect to the air over the duration of its trip. Likewise, in special relativity, we find that for any two clocks that are separated and rejoined, whichever clock turned around or accelerated to rejoin its companion will always end up recording less elapsed time.
And this is no surprise, of course, since the derivation they used is exactly the same as is commonly done using light waves. But if the clock is in motion, the distance that the sound wave has to travel between detectors now becomes greater than d, meaning it takes a longer amount of time for the wave to travel that distance and thus a longer time for the moving clock to tick. But they were able to do all this while having a preferred frame of reference where the clocks are running the fastest, and namely the air itself. But what if we had a version of atomic clock that would be using sound waves instead of light waves? Well, in this case, we would count the number of oscillations in the created sound wave. But if the source was moving relative to the air, there will be a shift in wavelength of the sound. And since the wavelength is longer, it will take more time to make the same amount of oscillations than for the stationary case. And therefore, the stationary clock would see the moving clock run slower. So the atomic clocks are basically light clocks. So we can't easily say that experiments measuring time dilation using atomic clocks are really proof that time slows down in motion. So if there was a similar medium for light, as there is air for sound, then using atomic clocks we wouldn't measure any difference from what we are measuring right now. Of course, sound wave analogy has some limits. You could put one clock in a box to protect it from air, and it would show the fastest time, which you could use to determine the rest frame of the outside air. But if there was a similar medium for light, it must be such that it doesn't interact with matter. Otherwise, the Earth would slowly spiral down to the Sun due to drag, and therefore such a box for atomic clock would not work. But there is another issue with the sound wave analogy. If you are passing by a clock that is at rest relative to the air, you would see it tick faster than yours. And theoretically, if there were many clocks, you could find the one that is the fastest, and you would know that it's stationary. In special relativity, every time you see a clock moving relative to you, they tick slower. The problem is that in the real world, there is nothing faster than light. And therefore, the only way to check how fast a clock is running is to check. But if you are locking, you have to include a longitudinal Doppler effect. This means that time between ticks of the clock you observe will be faster if you are moving towards it and slower if you are moving away from it, due to the fact that the wave has to travel different distance to the observer after each tick. If you calculated the contribution from the longitudinal Doppler effect, you would get that for the approaching clock, the time interval on your clock is equal to the 1 minus beta factor, where this beta is the velocity in the units of the speed of light. If you are approaching, let's say, with the velocity of 0.86c, then each second on the observed clock would equal only for 0.14 seconds on your clock. So you would see the clock running fast, and even if you accounted for the time dilation of the clock, you would still get 0.28 seconds for each tick. So it is not true that in special relativity you must always see the moving clock running slow. So now I want to summarize all of what I said so far. The sound wave analogy predicts exactly the same result for a twin paradox scenario as in special relativity. The sound wave analogy predicts that one observer could see other clock running slower than his own, but that is also the case in the special relativity due to longitudinal Doppler effect. The atomic clock is basically identical to the light clock. And since the medium for light doesn't interact with the matter, we can't use this trick isolating the clock from this medium to measure the real time speed. And ultimately, all clocks we are using today are somehow using the electromagnetic interaction so that the atoms can communicate with each other. And therefore, these interactions 
slow down in a moving frame. So ultimately, it might be the case that every clock we are using today is some version of a light clock in the end. So what makes us believe that special relativity is somehow special after all? I want to apologize now because some of the stuff I said were quite misleading. And some of you might have already noticed and be quite angry with me. But I want all of you to pause and think. Is there anything that makes an ultimate cut between sound wave analogy and special relativity? Okay, so to make the cut, we have to ask a simple question. Is there a simple clock that deviates from the light clock depending on the velocity relative to this ether? And by simple, I mean we can calculate the elapsed time on this clock and compare it with the light clock. And it turns out it is very simple. All you need to do is to just turn your clock by 90 degrees. Because so far, all of our discussion was about clocks that move perpendicularly to this medium. And I have already told you that the longitudinal effects on the elapsed time has much greater impact than transverse effect. As we already know, for the perpendicular clock, the time dilation factor is like this, whereas for rotated clock, we get a different factor. So the time dilation would be way stronger on such clock. So in the sound analogy universe, if we had atomic clock and rotate it, its time would run differently. And therefore you could easily conduct an experiment which would tell you how fast you are moving relative to the air. The GPS satellites would have to make sure that all clocks have the same orientation all the time. Otherwise, their accuracy would go through the window. But in our universe, it doesn't matter how you rotate this atomic clock. The time speed they show is always the same. This is what Michelson-Morley experiment have measured a long time ago. That the time delay does not depend on the orientation. Because we would get the interference on the detector. So in our universe, all clocks behave as if they were stationary the whole time, because these two clocks will always show the same time if they are not moving relative to each other. And if such a pair of clocks were moving relative to them, both of those clocks would be slower by the same rate, but that is only possible due to length contraction of the clock that lies in the direction of motion. Okay, I know I said that when we see other clocks moving, they don't have to show slower time due to longitudinal Doppler effect. The natural question would be, however, can we somehow filter out this effect to measure just pure time dilation? Or in other words, does the Doppler effect in special relativity behave differently than that in a sound wave universe? And the answer is simply yes. In sound wave universe, if you move relative to a certain source, the total Doppler effect would look like this, because you have only the longitudinal effect. In special relativity, the situation is kinda different though, because time dilation is a real fundamental effect and not the illusion. If you move relative to a certain source, the longitudinal Doppler effect would look like this. And it is simply the combination of the classical longitudinal effect and the transverse effect. But what is the reason for this transverse part if the source wasn't moving in the transverse direction at all? You can analyze the equation for a source moving towards and away from you separately and you can use Tyler expansion. You see that the first order of beta there is only a sign difference, as it should be due to classical longitudinal Doppler effect. But when you look at the second order term, you see that the sign is the same. And this is the time dilation contribution. And it is independent on the direction of motion. And it always makes the moving clock run slower. All you need to do now is to create an experiment that is sensitive enough to measure this second power in beta contribution in the observed frequency. And you are done.
Relativity is proven and it has been done a long time ago. And that's where the sound analogy ends. You probably know about the muon paradox, where we detect a much higher flux of muons from the upper atmosphere than we should considering their mean lifetime. The explanation is time dilation. But what type of clocks is inside elementary particles? If you still think that time dilation is just a clock issue, then why does it happen to muons? Can you imagine more fundamental clocks than that inside of elementary particles? So there you have it. Time dilation is about time after all, even though dialect disagrees. So that is it for this video. And now, when you fixed your view of time dilation, maybe you should also fix length contraction in this video up here. I see you there. Bye.